What's going on, brothers? It's your boy O'Shea Duke Jackson back at it again with another episode of the Hall of Game. And we create this show. Um, uh, and my bad, Gabe, I was probably a little bit too late and he probably fell asleep or I fell asleep. But we create this show, our live stream for uh professional black men, our brothers who want to, you know, basically improve whether it's you know like technical or soft skills uh people who are making a a, ch a change non-traditional or traditional students um in entrepreneurship right so we bring guys from all across those sectors to attack the whole conglomerate and today we're talking with my brother mediocre two tutorials and reviews you might have seen his channel is kind of getting very popular here on youtube and today we're talking about should black men consider um pursuing the MBA program. And this is a brother with an MBA. I'll let him introduce yourself, himself. Go ahead, brother. So first of all, O'Shea, um, appreciate the opportunity to come on to your channel. You know, just like we were talking behind stage for a second. I, I see the, your work ethic and it, and it pushes me to, to, to go forward and keep on generating valuable content for, for people. So number one, thank you, brother. Uh, number two, um, you know, I am a, um, corporate dude throughout the entirety of my life. I've got an MBA. I graduated uh, seven years ago uh, with this MBA. So I think that I have uh, good experiences and good value and want to just be able to talk to y'all today um, as, as fluid and as as much as I can regarding the potential benefits. There, there are some cons of it as well, but you know, I can get into both. Okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Let, let's talk about this because um, so Let's look at your under, because actually the MBA is just like a professional school, like the Master's of Divinity, Medical Doctorate, Law mm -hmm. School, Dental School. Those are professional programs. So mm -hmm. let's talk about what, what did you major in undergrad? Yeah, sure. So I, I can get into the whole history, too, because, yeah, um, you, know, you know, a lot of people probably even like on my own channel, a lot don't know my own history. And I, it's kind of funny, like the type of content that I'm doing right now. If I upload a video that has to do with like financial literacy or like going back to school, it gets like a tenth of the views. You see what I'm saying? So right. I tend not to focus into it as much. So a little bit about me. So I'm originally from New York. Uh, I lived there up until 18. And then I went um, to uh, undergrad. I went to Penn State for undergrad. OK, a PWI, predominantly white institution um, during that time and like kind of understanding and finding myself, I was trying to pick something. And I knew I took an economics class in my last year of high school and I knew I liked business. You're right. So I didn't mm -hmm. know too much about it, but I knew I liked that. So I started off with a business degree at Penn State. And then later on, I figured, well, I like technology as well. So let me try to combine it. So I combined the two and I had a MIS degree that I ended up graduating with. Management information systems is what that stands for. I'm not big on acronyms. Um, so I did that. I graduated there um, and I had an internship um, before I ended up leaving. That was at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Um, and then I transitioned that internship into a full time offer, which was a game changer because I was like your typical college student. You know, and I, I hate to say typical like that, but, um, you know, I didn't really have a plan. Um, and then I ended up interviewing. Based off, based off of a job that I had in my last year of, of undergrad, I was credit card, cold, cold card calling, collections agent. And I transitioned that into um, getting into the headquarters of J.P. Morgan Chase um, as a business analyst. So essentially, I transitioned that to a full time role. I worked there for about four years or so. And then I came to a point where I wanted something more. I wanted to be able to um, increase my business toolkit and my business acumen. So then I started looking out on what I can do to be able to do that, to take me to the next level. Not even just like as a young black man, trying to find out more about myself, but also to make more money. I mean, let's, let's be frank, you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's keep it a hundred over here. Um, so I ended up trying to figure out how to, to do that. Thought an MBA would be a fantastic route also. Cause I, I thought I'd be staying in corporate America for a pretty good amount of time. Um, I ended up applying to different programs and mm -hmm. I ended up applying to this one organization and I don't want to, uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, but I ended up okay. getting a full tuition scholarship to get my MBA, which was an absolute game changer. And I want to be able to share this resource with everyone who's down in the comments as something that they can use, something tangible that they can use. So essentially I went and I did this two year program and it was a fantastic experience and we can get into it as well. Cause 
maybe a lot of people in the chat don't really know what business school is actually like. But mm -hmm. I did this. I did a fantastic two year program, got to see the world as well uh, during the time because I did a study abroad. Uh, and then I ended up getting on with the company that I'm currently at with right now. It's still a Fortune 100 company. And I have been there uh, excelling uh, ever since. I've been there since I graduated. Um, so about yeah. six and a half, seven years or so. OK, let me kind of go back to um, after Penn State. One of the things that, you know, uh, Brother Gabe talks about is the power of internships, because that's one thing. If I can go back to my undergraduate uh, career. I was like, you know what? I'm trying to go to professional school anyway. Like, I don't give a damn about no internships. But yeah, I look back at it now and see that that was a um, um, something that I really missed out on. How did you know that that you wanted to take a paid, I mean, an internship? And was it paid or unpaid? It was paid. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I knew that. So here, here's what happened. I, I did three years at my undergrad and did it just like you know what, what you think a dude who's from New York who goes out of state to school does i had a lot of fun okay and then i got over to my la i got up to my last year and i knew like at the end of the day um i didn't want to go back home i love new york i love new york um but i didn't want to go back home and live under my parents rule okay i was living with my pops at the time um i didn't i love my pops to death I, but there was something about me where i knew i didn't want to go back so i was like okay um and i started to research like what is going to be the best way for me to have the best options. And um, at Penn State, they do these career fairs. And I saw that they were going to be recruiting for um, at JP Morgan Chase, Chase Card Services, which is based out of Wilmington, Delaware, at their corporate headquarters. And at the time, I was a collections agent. So I started like gaining all these skill sets and, and understanding credit cards or what have you. So I, I said to myself, okay, well, I can try to make this jump. And it just so happened that, you know, I ended up interviewing, ended up doing, you know, kind of well. And then they wanted to get me on. Um, and really it was just an understanding that, you know, um, you know, it's kind of the old trope that they're not going to hire you unless you have experience, but what do you do if you don't have experience? So I just did everything in my power to try to get real world experience. And, you know, whether it's paid or unpaid, um, I think that the more transferable skills that you could potentially show an employer now, no, whether or not if you're in a fraternity, whether or not, you know, you're working for free it, it, or, you know, someplace up the block, what companies and employers are really keen on is what are those transferable skills? And it's like, no matter what you're doing, you can make a story out of anything, but it just, mm -hmm. it really depends on how um, you're creating that story. Right. Uh, and, and, and what is the work that you're doing to create that package of who you are and where you want to go? Because that's the number one thing, because I've also done recruiting as well, is that like as long as you can make the story make sense. Right. No matter what the experience was from paid, unpaid, you have to make that story relevant and, and, and show those transferable skills for whatever it is that you're trying to go. Now, let me ask you this. And shout out to Brother Dark Man, Jeff out of South Carolina. What's good? Also, thanks for the dope show yesterday. Thank you, brother. Uh, I believe he's trying to uh, be an accountant or he is at least one now. Let me when you say transferable skills, can you uh, mm -hmm. define that for the audience? Yeah, sure. So a transferable skill is anything that you're doing now. And then when you start interviewing, you can talk about those skills uh, mm -hmm. in a way to align yourself to the position that you're trying to get. Right. For example, um, you know, if you're a car salesman, right, you have these kind of key skills, they're sales skills and, and mm -hmm. not being able to tell a story about your transferable skills is to say, you know, I did car sales. Right. But right. showing the transferable skills is saying, listen, I am really awesome at um, conveying my ideas to people in a way to get them to change their mind. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the difference of the two, just think of the impact of that and being able to tell a story of key times that mm -hmm. you showed how you changed someone's mind. Right. Like they came in, they had a certain amount of credit. You know, they didn't think that they were going to be able to do it. And then you mm -hmm. turn something around into value for them. Now, whether or not I did that in a credit card facility or you did it at car salesman, the employer that is trying to hire you, they're looking for these key transferable skills. So, mm. you know, what I was doing at, at, you know, as I worked in the credit card, you know, industry, I was writing down, like, what are the things that I'm actually doing? Like, if I was to peel back the onion to get under, like, what are the resume bullet points that mm -hmm. I would write down regarding this experience? Um, mm -hmm. And those proved invaluable as I was concocting these stories for employers. Mm -hmm. 
How did you how did you know how to do that though? Um, you know, a lot of Google searching, um, a lot of a lot of mentorship from other people who had done it before me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and just to harp on that real quick, you know, I had a really good circle of um men around me during that time that Okay. You know, we're doing it. And, you know, I would ask for coaching from them. And mm -hmm. I also tapped in a lot into the career um, uh, uh, services department at my school. I mean, I was up right. there on a monthly basis. You know, and this is in the fourth year. So it was like it was crunch time, you mm -hmm. know, and I was doing mock interviews with them as well. And they were making this it is under, in undergrad, right? Yeah. yeah, In undergrad. It's not even okay. business school. I, we, we can okay. get there because it changed yeah. up in business school. But yeah, I was I was there at a weekly basis getting um, interviews, you know, and 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 within that, like one of the type of questions that employers like to ask, especially now, is like these behavioral based interview questions where you have to tell these really succinct and finite stories of, you know, what it is, you know, that you did to rise the rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. So um, within that, you have to have these stories in your mind. And if you come in there unprepared, then they know that you hadn't done the due diligence to really figure out who you are and, and where you want to go. But it's all around that alignment, right? Like if you're going for a job and you don't even know what the job's about, or you don't even know why you'd be a good fit for the job or stories that you can tell of transferable skills to get you in that position, then an employer is going to look at you like, you know, what, what am I going to do with you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, so once you graduated from Penn state and I, I remember, I, I, I don't know, so much about NBA schools, but I do know from you, you reading U.S. news and grad reports that, you know, obviously mm -hmm. GMAT is required. And what are the things that for most um, schools is there's a period of work history? I have a homeboy that went to Harvard yeah. NBA and then he had to work. Um, he moved to like North Carolina. And he was working in the bank industry out there for like mm -hmm. four to five years before he was able to go. That's one mm -hmm. of the things. GPS would be pretty good. GMAT would be pretty good. But mm -hmm. how long? How much work experience did you have to have before you were able to actually say, all right, I need to take the GMAT? And then kind of how did you prepare for GMAT and stuff like that? Yeah. OK. And, and this is work experience specific to the MBA program, right? Right. Um. So at, at the time that I started to apply, I was like two and a half years in the game, uh, maybe three years into the game. And um, I had received a promotion maybe like a couple of months before I really started to study. So I would say um, it's different for everybody, right? Um, a good rule of thumb is right around, you get an undergrad, you're working somewhere, you get around two to two and a half years under your belt. And whether or not you get promoted at that time or not, you should really start to consider, especially um, if you were direct from undergrad going into your grad degree program. You know, I went in at about 26, I think mm -hmm. I was at the time. So it took about three and a half years for me to make that transition over um, but the amount of relevant work experience, I think, was really applicable because especially in an MBA degree, it's different than uh, a law degree and it's different than a med school degree in a sense of the more experience that you have, the more valuable the MBA experience, um, because the MBA itself mm -hmm. is kind of like a job, um, you know, that you go to every day. Well, most days. Um, it's kind of like a job in the sense that, you know, you're bringing in your skill set in order to, you know, inform the class and to bring the discussion up to a higher level. Um, so I say that to say you don't have to have a work experience, but it looks a lot better on your MBA grad school resume if mm -hmm. you have a considerable amount of years behind you um, mm -hmm. before you embark on that journey. Let, let me ask you this also, because in, in the, um, the MBAs, at least most of them, mm -hmm. um, there's certain specific, there's certain concentrations, uh, accountancy, entrepreneurship, management. Yep. Um, so which was your concentration and, 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 and why did you pick that one? Yeah, th there's a bunch of different concentrations. And I also wanted to touch on that too. Like, you know, depending upon which your interests are is also mm -hmm. going to dictate which type of schools that you should be going to, you know, like, you know, generally in like MBA programs, like you generally want to get into a top 10 program because then you have your pick of the litter of organizations after that. But like, let's say you go to a top 20, 30, 40, or even a top hundred program, you know, it's, it then becomes really important for you to understand what is it that you want to do? Cause there's certain schools that are known for being a consultant. There's certain schools that are known for finance, right? There's certain schools that's mm -hmm. known for brand management, right? Um, and 
Um, I'm gonna keep it funky. Like, so me, I went through a different method, right? Like, cause I applied, I applied to this organization. I wanted to talk about it as well. It's called the consortium for graduate study and management. And for everyone that's in the chat, that's interested in a resource for helping you to apply to different grad schools, um, as well as the potential for full tuition or half tuition scholarships as well. The URL is cgsm.org. Right. So I ended up applying to this organization. And what they do is they are in support of underrepresented uh, uh, minority students to help bloister their numbers in business school. And thus, thus bloister numbers of underrepresented minorities in corporate America. So they make the application process a lot easier for you because within their member schools, which typically most of the member schools, like I want to say out of the 28 or so member schools, like. 26 of them are in the top 40. Okay. So 26 or so in the top 40. So um, I ended up applying through this way. And then honestly, brother, like everything on my um on my application was tight. Everything was tight except for my GMAT score. Except for my GMAT score. My GMAT score was trash. And I've never been a really good standardized test taker. Mm -hmm. So I strategically chose a school that was ranked lower on like the US news report top right. ranking in order to increase my chances or my likelihood of getting money. Okay. okay. So, and I'm gonna keep it funky because the money situation, I know a lot of people that are in here are not even considering postgraduate degrees because of the amount of investment that you have to put mm -hmm. into it. Um, but I would employ brothers or sisters if they down into the chat listening um, to take a look at that resource because that resource right there legitimately changed my life. Um, because without it, I'm not sure if I would have taken that step in order to get the, the program because I would have spent literally an extra hundred thousand dollars. OK, now there's a uh, a brother who's at the Stern Business. I think it's NYU. I know NYU. Yep. Shout out mm -hmm. to Brother Ryan. He's at the Stern Business School mm -hmm. um, and you're familiar with us a lot. Wow. A lot of brothers have you don't know until you come up with these topics that, that you know, people are, are doing this. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Um. I know from what I've heard from people, because I actually had an interest in at one point wanting to get an MBA, mm -hmm. but I, I do I, I do hear, I do hear about the fact that a lot of the the uh, projects and you know in medical school is a lot of individualized learning, but I heard like yeah. an MBA it's like a group projects and group learning. Yeah. How is the everyday? How is that a learning process um, in those two years uh, at B school? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. It's a lot of group work. Uh, so each program is going to have um, different amount of group activities in implemented into the strategy of the programs. Um, so it's a case by case, school by school, like Stern is going to be different than the school that I went to. Right. Um, so but at the same time, what they're trying to do is to prepare you to work in a corporate environment and atmosphere. Right. Um, so, you know, I've been in corporate America throughout the entirety of my career. Um, and you're always in group projects. You're always in, you know, having to work with other people and other diverse people, very diverse who think extremely differently than you. Right. Um, you know, me being like in the department that I work in right now, and we can also get into too, kind of like what I do at, at, you know, at the place that I'm at, I, I think it'd probably help people as well. Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Like, that. you know, I, I'm, I am in nothing but group activities with people who grew up nothing like how I did. Right. So, uh, within that, the school that I went to had 50% international students. Um, okay. uh, so I, I'm over here in, in, um, conversations with people that grew up nowhere near how I grew up, but it just, it taught me a lot of things about communication. It taught me a lot of things about having to, um, adjust, um, kind of components of my personality in order to fit well in these types of environments while under extreme duress, because the deadlines within an MBA program can be arduous. You see what I'm saying? I'm not sure if I answered your, your question, brother. Um, but I think I did. You, it was a specific question for group activities, right? No, no, you're good. Okay. Um, so also too, I wanted to, Go ahead. yeah, I was also going to touch on, on kind of like the stuff that I'm doing right now. So, sure. um, uh, so right now, um, I am what you call a, uh, product owner or a product manager, uh, for digital, mm -hmm. right? So I manage a suite of assets or capabilities, 
uh, that we fit on our, uh, our the company that I work for on our digital uh, uh, property. So like on a, a web page, right, or on a mobile app. Uh, and I am in charge of uh, creating and iterating on these digital products, um, which is interesting because, you know, as I listened to previous Hall of Games, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, if you want to be involved in technology, you know, here's these coding aspects. And the thing is, is like I've always wanted to be involved in technology, but I knew early on from my undergrad degree that I never wanted to be a coder. So mm -hmm. right now being in charge of kind of the the strategy or the business behind the creation of these digital capabilities, you know, it really scratches uh, like a really uh, deep itch for me because I've always been like a technology geek. You see what I'm saying? So if there's any questions in the chat, you know, regarding kind of the career path that I that, that I'm taking, you know, mm -hmm. feel free to send me emails or what have you. And I can be able to talk to any of the brothers that that are interested in getting involved with technology, but not having to code. OK, OK. Very interesting. Let me give a, a few shout outs to brother Jason Eddy out of Canada. He's his first time donating new grad. Love this topic. Thank you, brother Chief Rocca. Declaration says, how are one year programs thought of by employers? Hey, listen. So, you know, that's that's so there are um, within the last um, five years, five to 10 years or so, there's been a an, an explosion of one year programs within MBA. There's also um, executive MBA programs as well. We can get into that as well. But the one year mm -hmm. programs, um, I actually one of my best friends, he did Emory one year program and he ended up getting a um, a job right out of the one year program. I think he worked in corporate for Home Depot for like five years before he went to go do something else. Um, so I will say that like whether it's a one year program or a two year program, number one, a young one year program, your life is gone for that year. What I appreciate about the two year program is that, you know, at least I had some some free time to do some other things outside of that. But from mm -hmm. an employer's perspective, like if I was looking at your resume and trying to hire you, I wouldn't discount you if you went through a one year MBA program. But results may vary. But I would say less now than ever before, there's been this less stringent idea of, yes, you must do a two year MBA program in order to be recognized. Uh, but I would say kind of more important than one year versus two year is the strength of the program um, that you're going into. You know, and I see like a lot of brothers that, you know, sign up for online MBA programs and those online MBA programs or an MBA program that's like, in you know, between ranking 100 to 150. Um, then begin to regret their decisions because employers mm -hmm. may not respect those programs as much, but they charged you just the same amount. Right. Okay. And that's that's a very important distinction. So, I, you know, I would say um, and we can get into tips as well as things to okay. bolster or improve, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of kind of what it is that you bring to the table, because um, I've done hiring um, for the company that I currently work for. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, is. Um, there's also a yearly MBA conference, which is one of the largest career fair recruiting uh, conferences in the United States of America. And that's called the National Black MBA Association and the Career Fair, which is usually around um, the September, uh, I think it's around the September, October ish time frame. Hopefully this, you know, COVID stuff gets gets, you know, um, it settles by that time. Um, so I've gone back and helped to recruit for the last seven years for this organization. Um, and as well, I did three years before that applying to organizations at this particular yearly conference. And I want to say each year they get between 10,000 and 12,000 folks that come in um, and they switch as cities too. And it's often in like a lot of dope cities, like they do Houston, Atlanta, like the parties be off the chain. But you know what I mean? It's um, it's another resource, you know, to think about as you're thinking about, um, you know, now that you have this particular MBA skill set, how can I go off and find an employer that will respect my skill set? And it's through these career fairs and conventions. OK, let me let me do the shots. Uncle Mark Hill. Uh, great discussion. Let me let me talk about this. Right. So I know the U.S. News when I used to read it when I was, you know, possibly going to do that. And especially mm -hmm. also in law school, there's the full time programs. And then obviously you have the part time programs and, yep. and most MBA programs, even in the top 50. I don't know about I, I know even that, you know, like Berkeley does it and mm -hmm. UC Davis does it. Some of the, the yep. schools on the lower tier, mm -hmm. they will have either satellite campuses 
are part time. So my question to you is for, for the brothers that are currently working that would like to be able to, to do this, you know, in three years or three and a half years. Mm-hmm. How do re- uh, employers look at you are a graduate of a part time MBA program? And I know that yep. it's a little bit um, easier to get into. Mm-hmm. Also, yep. well, what, what do what do uh, how do employers look at part time MBA uh, graduates from, you know, the top 50? Yeah. So, you know, it's um, it's going to vary. Uh, and I hate to say that I hate to be like a it depends type of a dude. Let, let me give you a quick example. Um, so like if you're graduating from a part time program, but the part time program is down the street from the organization that you want to join, it may not matter as much. And it may not matter as much because not only are you in the same general vicinity, but you probably have a lot of people who work at that organization that have degrees from that MBA school or program. OK, now, if you, you know, let's say you do a part time program in New York and then you end up traveling off to the West Coast for some reason, they won't give you as much respect because the name of the school that you went to in New York, unless it's like a top 20 or 30 school. Right. Or t- especially a top 10. Like if you go into Harvard or all of these like crazy international schools, like an inset or something like that. If you go into one of those, like you're good regardless, no, wherever, wherever, even if you do a, a part time program, like if you do a Harvard part time, you're you're still good right wherever. I don't even know if Harvard has a part time program, though. But um, but I would say it's very location um, specific. Um, and it's also the ties. Right. So like the organization that I work for, we have um, ties with certain schools throughout the country where, you know, we can go on that uh, up to that school's campus. We do talks and then we might recruit right after the talk. Um, And because we have, you know, extenuating relations with these schools, no matter where they are in the country, no matter if you're full time or part time, we're going to show you probably more kind of visible respect on your resume. Um, But I would say even above the school, like, you know, it's like work experience in school. Right. Like and it just depends. Like, you know, my first role coming out of my MBA program was um, consulting. And, um, you know, and I would help them kind of recruit for consulting. And the one thing is, is that the VP of the organization that I work for, she was really keen on, you know, irrespective of an MBA, you know, or, you know, where their undergrad was at, if they have consulting experience at like the big four, right, like the top four, you know, we're going to give them a much larger shot and give them an interview before, you know, smaller consulting firms or an MBA program that's not really as tied to consulting programs. Okay. Okay. No, definitely understand. Shout out to the brother with I think that's Korean writing with the five dollars um, super chat. I didn't think the Harvard um, or even you know those have one. But let me ask yeah. you this though. Um, thank you, mm-hmm. Doctor Dickinary P, for the dollar and I. Thank you, brothers, for being here. Where is the link for his channel? Thank you. Uh, let me do this real quick because um, the channel name is uh, a <laughs> mediocre tutorials. That's it's- interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's it's long. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let me let me let me uh do that. Guys, I'm gonna make sure I get uh him. Okay, so he has almost ten thousand subscribers, right? And he's a really yeah. good channel. Um, you guys will be highly entertained. He has really good interviews. Oh, hold on one second. All right, so guys, make sure you subscribe and to his channel right there, hit the bell. Um, I'm putting the link there. Let me talk to you about this because there are some people before the show started. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you know what? An MBA, it's a waste of time. And mm-hmm. I, I do know you said like, you know, 100 to 150, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. But um, what are some of the, let's talk about some of the cons, if you can, right? And and obviously in the market right now, obviously yeah. we're facing the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the, what are some of the cons of yeah. obtaining the MBA, let's say the top 50 schools? Yep. Right now. What, what, are, what are some of the cons? Yeah. I mean, it's it's going to be time, um, time and risk. Right. Like so, um, you know, I would say, you know, no matter what your decision is going to be. And, I, you know, I, I went through this crazy. It was different for me because I was 26, didn't have kids, wasn't in a relationship. And I can just I can just go. I can just go wherever, right. you know, the world was my oyster, you know, and it, my life is still like that now. But, um, you know, but I will say um, it's time. Um, it's making sure that you pick the right program, 
uh, because if you don't, then you might have a bad experience. Oh, oh, um, oh, oh say it again. Say that last part again, because Negroes don't be hearing me when I talk about that. You did what? I forgot what I said, bro. (laughs) No, no, no. This is important because a lot of people don't know, just like if you like sports, right? Player in the right system, picking the right offensive coordinator, if you can do that. Picking the right program really matters. How do you know, though? Because a lot of brothers don't understand this. For undergrad or even grad, picking the right program with the right resources is very detrimental to your success, right? So, I mean, it could be detrimental to to your failure, right? Let's talk about this. How do you know, how can a a person pick the right program for their needs? Yeah, I I mean, and the thing is, it's it's more easy now than ever before. And Mm -hmm. it's really research, right? Um, And I say that I'm being a bit facetious, but here's how I did it, right? Um, uh, So, and I guess mine was a little bit different because I I was looking from the consortium of lists. And I said, that's all that I'm going to be able to apply for especially with the GMAT score that I had, okay? So I looked at that list that was at, in the consortium. Again, that's cgsm.org. They haven't changed the URL. I, I hope that they didn't. Um, uh, so I looked at their list and I said, hmm, okay, what do they have to offer, okay? What do they have to offer? And I went down on the list and I made myself a book and I wrote down in the book, okay, looking at Stern, which is NYU. Okay, here's what they're known for. Here's the type of employers that generally hire for them. These are the type of career fairs that they have. Here's the portion of the country that they have that that they are in. You know, what are the type of opportunities that are over there now? Now, Stern is different because they're in New York and there's every opportunity available in New York. But, you know, New York's in is a unique case. Okay, Mm -hmm. Um, but like if I wanted to get into tech, well, you know, it wouldn't make as much sense going to a school in the Midwest that's top you know, that's in the between the 30s to 40 ranking, right? Because the tech sector on the West Coast is not going to give as much respect. Now, if I went to a USC, you know, if I went to a UC Berkeley, that's Mm -hmm. different because I'm already on the West Coast and, you know, Cali is the tech hub, Silicon Valley, right? So like, it's just the due diligence that you put into it to really understand who you are and where you want to go And then it's just like, it's a Rubik's cube, you know, it's a puzzle. It's a thousand piece puzzle that you're just trying to construct in a way to understand what is the most likely thing that I'm going to do now, real quick. Mm -hmm. A lot of brothers may not know, a lot of human beings may not know what they're trying to do. They may, they just may know, they just may have an idea, but the, the MBA program is, is built with that in mind. And, um, uh, within a oh, I just remember a question that, that you asked me before. It was like, which concentrations did I pick? Um, so generally, when you go get an MBA, uh, MBA degree, you can get just get a general MBA, okay? Uh, and then you can select your, um, some schools call it focus. Some schools call it, um, uh, let's just stay, well, let's, let, let's just stick with focus for right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, concentration, that's what I, the word I was looking for. Right. Um, my school was a concentration. Here's what I picked, right? So we talked about kind of things that I was interested in, in before, um, technology. I've always been like a technology geek. I picked e-commerce as a concentration. And then I also picked computer and information uh, systems and marketing. And I knew within those three, there was going to be something in there that I was going to be interested in doing, right? So like if I wanted to go to brand management route, yeah, it wasn't a brand management concentration, but I can still use that marketing in order to get in brand management. Like, oh, I'm taking a look at this consultant thing or uh, because I was thinking about being a digital consultant. So like I can use this e-commerce over here and this computer information systems over over there. And now that I've dovetailed my role into being a digital product manager, right, um, it's all still relevant. So it's like as I'm picking the school and the this and the that, it's like, how do I mitigate the risk that I'm going to select something that I'm going to regret later? Because I see so many people that, you know, select undergrad degrees, for an example, and then they go back and they look at it. And it's just like, why did I pick that? You see what I'm saying? Um, you know, looking at the job market, you know, yeah. taking a look at, you know, what are the most in demand options for myself? Like, I, you know, I saw a brother in there talking about uh, accounting. We're going to need accountants for a long time. You see what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Um, we're going to need them for a long time. Now, if you go and you get a gender studies degree in undergrad, you may not be as relevant from an employability perspective, you know, depending Mm -hmm. upon where where you go and what it is that you're trying to get into. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Now, guys, make sure you, you you check that out. Uh, now, I want to talk about um, so outside of time, right? And I know you know this could be two years of your part time longer. What are some of the other um, what are some of the other kind of you know cons? Cons, yeah. Uh, cost <laughs> is a big yeah. one. Okay. <clears throat> And I wanted to talk about that too. Um, you know, the resource for folks that are just coming into the chat, you know, the resource that's right down below cgsn.org uh, is one of the main reasons why I uh, chose to pursue my graduate degree. And it's because through that organization, I was able to get a full uh, tuition scholarship. Um, so within that being said, that knocked off a hundred thousand dollars, literally a hundred thousand dollars. It was like a hundred thousand dollar lotto ticket. Okay. Um, you know, would I have decided to go get an MBA to still go, uh, go to the program that I went to if it wasn't for that? I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that question for you, but the payoff was significant. So just to give you an idea, um, I ended up, um, at the time, let's say I was, I was working in Wilmington, Delaware. I was making about, I want to say like 50, between 50 and $55,000. Okay. Um, you know, which at the time, Oh, I was I was enjoying life, you know, because I'm like 25 years old or so. Um, the the organization that I moved into after that um, more than doubled that. OK, at, right after I got the program. So, again, what's the ROI? What's the return on that investment? Now, now the loans that I did accumulate because I was traveling the world and everything during my MBA program, it still took me some time to pay back because I did, you know, work up some significant loans you know, because of the lifestyle that I was living. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I I knew that I could because, you know, with the type of opportunities that you can gain and the type of revenue that you can garner with that, uh, with having that degree, I knew that I would be relatively safe. So again, it's, it's mitigating the risk. It's making sure that you pick the right team, just like you said, picking the right school. Um, And then it's also understand, understanding what type of money do you want to put in? What type of an investment do you want to put into your education? Like, like if you don't think that you're going to be in corporate America for a long period of time, I don't know if, if the MBA is, is correct for you. And, and I say that because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that don't have an MBA that are super okay. successful. Right, right. Super successful. But, I, you mm-hmm. know, but definitely if you want to be in the corporate environment, listen, we, we can have a whole discussion about, you know, because I see the Dame Dash videos where he talks about you're not a man, oh, yeah. you, you're doing it on your own and all of that stuff. Like, right. like, like we can absolutely continue to have that discussion. You see what I'm saying? I don't want to derail the conversation. Right. But, yeah, Dame um, Dash, they hating on the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I know you got some super chats, bro. I know if you want to. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and uh and shout them out. Shout out to brother SMS. This is one of, must be one of your, your fans over here. Mediocre's channel is excellent. Level-headed self-improvement content. You should have them on more. Mr. J, keep it up on today. Carter Designer Chris. Thank you, brother, for the ten dollars. This is a good brother right there. Make sure to all the brothers over here. Um, we want to subscribe to his channel. So if we, if we can take him to ten thousand tonight, that would be great. Everybody that's that can hit the link and subscribe at the bell. Uh, could you do that? That would be great. Um, some some of you people already know who he is, uh, obviously. Um, and but for those who don't, let's um, subscribe, hit the bell, let's help the brother get to the ten thousand tonight. I would uh, definitely appreciate it if we we're able to do so because uh, he's dropped a major major game. I know a game that he's gonna look at this like, damn man, I should have been on tonight. <laughs> but um, but but let me let me talk about this because for brothers out there that are um. You know, let's 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 look at this because we have a lot of black men. Shout out to Brother Keith. I think Brother Keith was in the um uh let me see where the, where that Negro go. He knows what I'm talking about. He's talking about Brother Keith. Um, I think he's from Mississippi or Memphis, something like that. We have a lot of black men who are non-traditional students, and I know the MBA, it's not required that you have a business degree to enter. Facts. But let's say, for example, you're a person like myself who graduated mm-hmm. undergraduate. Shout, shout, shout out to brother Native or Negro out of uh, North Carolina. Um, you graduated in biology mm-hmm. and you're looking at getting an MBA. Mm-hmm. So obviously you probably, you, if you graduate in biology, you haven't taken accounting in your undergraduate cur- curriculum and you may not have taken economics. How do you, as a non-traditional student, um, go into 
let's say if you majored in something that was not business related, you want to go to the MBA program. What are what are some of the things you can do if you're thinking about it? Yeah. So I, I'm so you. you oh, say you ask fantastic questions, brother. I just, I just wanted uh, to, to commend you on your, your interviewing skills. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. The white man, he taught me something, brother. You know, he held me fantastic. back. But he, he taught me how to do <laughs> things, brother. Um, so actually, a lot of these MBA programs mm -hmm. like you more to not mm -hmm. have a, a, a business degree. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones that they love engineering. MBA programs love engineers. Love yeah. them. Love the, the, the guy, the guy from Amazon. No, no, I don't know if he was. Did he go to MBA? Did he get an MBA? The, the, who's the guy that owns Amazon? I know you went to Cornell undergrad. Oh, Be uh, Bezos. Bezos. What's it? Did he yeah, get an I MBA? Think, no, I think he dropped out of undergrad. Jeff Bezos definitely finished engineering school. Went to oh, Princeton. Did he? I'm thinking but of, I, I, you're, you're right. I do know a whole lot of people that typically are engineers do go to MBA programs do very well. I do know that. Yeah. Yeah. I like, like some of the ones, you know, they, they do that. And, and I see a lot of them do that. And then they go in the consultant. And the thing is like, they have a, you know, graduating from an engineering undergraduate program, you know, you have a, um, a substantial financial uh, background, but, but see, the thing is, is like a lot of these programs know that, you know, they have to be teaching you these things over. So, um, the thing is, is like, yes, you'll have an uphill battle because some of the concepts that you'll learn, I already learned during my business school, but trust and believe like, um, it's still, it's still tough. Even for me with a, having a business undergrad degree from Penn state, taking even accounting one-on-one during my MBA program was crazy. And often I found that folks that had a substantial math background, you know, that they were a math teacher or they were an engineer or even like um, sciences um, were even a little bit farther ahead than me because their mind just formed these numbers better than mm -hmm. even me do, taking an accounting class like back in the day. So I say all that to say, don't let the obstacle of not never not knowing anything about business sway you. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, the knowledge of the things that I picked up during my my um, my MBA school is actually things that I use on the channel, bro. Like, you know, from a marketing perspective, from a, um, a ideation and, you know, like idea discovery perspective, from, mm -hmm. a, you know, tailoring my message to the audience and, you know, the visual things and components that I'm doing and the surveys that, I'm, that I do on my channel in order to understand my audience more. It's like all of these components that like, you know, um, as someone who doesn't have an MBA, it may come a little bit uh, longer to you. Um, but at the same time, the things that I'm learning and implementing on the channel still doesn't, you know, you know, the money that I put into the MBA program doesn't still, it doesn't show any ROI for creating a YouTube channel. You see what I'm saying? But it's just nuggets that I've used throughout right. life um, to help me in other avenues. You, you know, I, I've also found that out, like people that have uh, some form of like, like professional education, mm -hmm. when they come to YouTube, um, this the, you, you, even though you don't know all about the YouTube algorithm and all about other things, but you do know like, oh, these like the, those transferable skills, mm -hmm. they come to YouTube. Right. And YouTube is one of those spaces where you bring everything that you do know to the platform to figure it out. Yeah. And um, it, it does give you somewhat of an advantage as a creator, because mm -hmm. one of the things I would say is like, you know, when you're an MBA program, or professional school, consistency is obviously something you have to do. Are you going to fail? And yeah. when you come to YouTube, it, being consistent as a YouTuber is almost like it's like clockwork now because we're so used to that, you know, Facts. Um, and, and understanding it as a business. Thank you, Brother Native Negro, for the um, uh, three hour ninety nine cent super chat. Let me ask you this, though. Um, for brothers that I mean, obviously, with this pandemic and mm -hmm. I, I, we can't forecast the future. Yep. But. How will NBA programs going forth be shaped? I mean, yeah. obviously, we don't know how the economy is going to rebound or what's going to happen. But do you think that that the that 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 the learning modules for you know the two year standard or part time NBA programs will they be affected in any way? And do you see uh, any any kind of shift in in yeah. in the in the way people recruit? Yep. Yeah. It, it, I how do you how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, uh, so and, and I love and I love the cov the caveat that you had is that, you know, we can't predict the future and I can't predict the future. But 
Um, man, uh, this is a loaded question because there's so many ways that you can go with it. Um, I think what this pandemic has shown us is that um, potentially how we do business may have to change, right? And and I, I hate to have a cup half empty view on kind of what this pe pandemic is doing to us, um, but it's significantly shifted not only how uh, people work, but how businesses have to think about their revenue generation models, okay? And there's so many different examples I could grab from, but I don't wanna go into separate, uh, separate type of conversation. I think that from a business school perspective, I think that they will thrive. I think that they will survive uh, because they'll be moving. Let's say we get into September, the new school year starts. I don't think that they're going to cancel courses. I think they're going to try to move everything online. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to move everything online. And I'm saying this from the perspective who, who of a person who works for an organization where we are 99% work from home right now. And literally it went from 0%, maybe 1% working from home. And then over the weekend, 99% working from home. So that's a key indicator for me to understand that if we're doing it at a corporate level, you know, within a, a Fortune 100 company, these business schools are going to have to adapt. So I think that um, moving to a digital experience, mm -hmm. the, I don't think it's going to remove a lot of value out of the experience besides that one-to-one -one touch. I just think that people are going to have to adapt. But to think that these schools are not planning for worst case sit scenarios or situations mm -hmm. is not realistic, especially when you know you kind of look at um, the success rates of students who take online courses or classes mm -hmm. and you know, and the and 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 for what I've seen, the numbers that I've looked at, it is not as much neg negatively affected as what we thought they might have been 15 or so years ago, right? At, you know, when the internet was just, you know, getting to where where to where it needs to go. Um, so I think that a lot of these institutions will end up shifting mm -hmm. to an entire entire semesters and years that are online, and we'll be meeting in these kind of digital spaces, um, and 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 working on it from from that perspective. Um, but when it comes to kind of, you know, it, a lot of this is like time will tell because the, there's so many different industries that will end up changing as a result of folks not being able to interact with non-essential businesses in a public format. There's so many things that can change because I'm even thinking, you know, you know, for the organization I, I work for, we have you know, different like insurance products or what have you. And and if there's not sp sporting events that are happening, let's say like a basketball sporting event, if there's not like a basketball sporting event, you know, then who's going to insure the half court shot that normally we gave re revenue from? You see what I'm saying? Because, oh, for folks that don't know, all those half court shot basket, those are all insured. Like the, mm -hmm. the stadium's not paying for the half court shot. That's all insurance. If someone was to happen to make one in, they just file an insurance claim and then another organization pays it. Key game. Um, but, I, but I'd say like a lot of different components within that are going to be shifting. So my thing is, is like as a person who's going to spend a lot of money and getting an MBA, you got to keep your ear to the streets to understand what will be in demand from a resource perspective going into the future. You know, mm -hmm. so many things are shifting. Like, I know, I, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know if, we, if there's any folks in here that, um, um, you know, play like uh, video games or anything like that. But like virtual reality, you know, there's a game that just came out called Half-Life Alex, and it's a VR game and you are completely digital. So mm -hmm. like as, as an organization, as a business, you got to say to yourself, hmm, let's say this uh, pandemic continues for a year. Let's say it continues for a year or two. And hmm, people are at home a lot more. And because they are at home a lot more, they are now engaging in activities at a rate that we didn't foresee before with all these uh, at home things and virtual reality. Guess what? In virtual reality, COVID doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Co COVID doesn't exist in virtual reality. Shout out to mm -hmm. Avatar. They foretold things like this happening way back in 2009, where a guy in a wheelchair can be swinging across vines in virtual reality. Now, if you take a look at what AI is is doing from a virtual reality perspective that you got to add and the fact that we're mm -hmm. in we're home a lot more now you're like mm, dang as a business 
let's say that there was an alternate reality created um, through VR. What are the ways that we can increase our revenue by stepping into these new models that we've never experienced before? So anyway, um, I'm I'm getting I'm postulating up here, but it was a it was a deep question. <laughs> so I feel like I needed a deep answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, shout out to Brother Black Heights. I don't know if you were on the uh, here yesterday. Black Heights, it was a Georgia Tech MBA in his, in his own right. Uh, O'Shea just took a break after a long day of calls. Just saw your email. Hell of a topic, brother, and a very intelligent brother who was killing. I will definitely link you to it by email um, after this show. Black Heights has a really, really, really good channel. Uh, his focus is on uh, management. Uh, so shout out to Black Heights. You know, he's really 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 bright just like you like yourself very very smart guy thank you man. Uh, i followed him i followed him last night from the oh, school yeah, he's last really night. really smart he's really i'll I be i'll be wanting to hate on a nigga sometime like god damn nigga, how you so smart um that's what i'll be doing and i'll be hating on niggas like man look at him man learn how to read and write and shit um <laughs> shout out to brother joshua good to see you here now let me let me let me uh ask you know another question because um you know some people were saying, like, with is there because remember those transferable skills you're talking about, you know, that you had aforementioned. You know, some people like, okay, for example, companies like Air Canada, you know, they laid off 15,000 people. I'm pretty sure could have been somebody with an MBA, right? Could have yep. been somebody in the marketing department. Yep. What happens, you know, because obviously we do know from the US news that in the top 50, at least, people were getting recruited. Even back in the 2010s, 2005s, starting average salary was at least 100 grand. The package is worth that. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you work yourself up in the corporate, you know, in, in you know area, and then there's layoffs, mm -hmm. and you're one of the people that are there with those layoffs? Um, it, yep. Is does that also happen to people in the, with MBA degrees? Or yeah. it does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I can get into that as well. Um, I, I tell this to even you know um, the uh, brothers that I mentor. Um, just as easy as you can leave, they can let you go. Okay, just as easy as you can leave, they can let you go. Um, you know, which is you know, and you know, going back to the Dame Dash comment before. Um, you know, which is part of his belief. You know, you're an expendable asset, and that's that's at the end of the day. Um, you have to understand, um, even sifting through the corporate culture and the propaganda, and you walk in a building and you see pictures of people shaking hands and high-fiving, but you have to understand, my bad, I just saw my mic was down in here. <laughs> um, you, you have to understand that what you're doing is you're exchanging time for money. That's what you're doing at the heart of it. So with that being said, you should always keep your resume updated. You should all your LinkedIn, always keep your LinkedIn updated. Always keep your digital properties updated. Always, you know, when you're, when you're taking, you know, um, you know, when you're doing like your quarterly reviews, take your quarterly reviews and make sure that you're consolidating those into and, and creating what those transferable skills are. I think what we're going through now is particularly Interesting because although 15,000 jobs, you know, uh, organization left uh, laid off, Air Canada laid off 15,000 people. Generally, if that something like that happens, there's somewhere else to go. Um, and what it seems like is happening now is like a lot of these organizations are, are having hiring freezes. Um, so this is a peculiar, a peculiar uh, situation um, in that particular sense. Um, but but I say all that to say, you know, and I got into it too. You know, organization I work for, I started drinking that corporate juice. And, you know, I started to get comfortable, you know, but um, one thing you have to understand is that you should never be comfortable. Um, and it's an uncomfortable feeling to never feel comfortable. But at the point that you get comfortable, that's when you have the most opportunity or the greatest risk to get the rug ripped from under you. Okay. So it's like, what are the things that you are doing in order to make sure that you are tackling this thing called life in a correct way? manner and and what are the strategies that you're putting in place that if something like this happens you're good you know whether that be like you know a financial emergency fund that you have built up and you're not spending it on you know a lease payment that you might have or whether that's not you know making sure that your resume is updated so you're prepared when things like this happen or making sure your network is good and ready to go 
Um, so I say all that to say, bro, um, you know, it just, it really depends in how you want to tackle it, but you have to be really strategic and in, 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 in all within an understanding that just as easy as you can leave, mm -hmm. they can let you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys hear that? You guys hear that? So, man, um, I knew this was going to be a good one, but this was a great one. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, I really do thank you, brother, for reaching out because, you know, you're a very talented brother. Thank you, um, obviously, you don't have to want to come in and share a game. You're doing well. Uh, but I do. And I'm sure the brothers that are here, you know, definitely appreciate, uh, you know, a lot of you brothers that are coming in the Antoine, uh, the Antoine Wade's, the, the, the Georgia Tech MBVs, the, the brothers like yourself, um, you know, a lot of the Gabe, the Gabe A's, right, the Andre Hatchets. A lot of the brothers are are starting to email and starting to, you know, wanting to come in and share their experience. The truck driving community, we have a lot of those guys, guys who own fleets. Mm -hmm. We have guys who are um, emergency medical doctors, right? Guys who are in, in the internal medicine registries, guys who are like a doctor, Kenya Meadows oncologist. We have guys that are coming in that, you know, that really want to participate in these specific streams only. I do thank you um, for for that. How can these people find you, man? Yeah. So, you know, I got another uh, uh, YouTube. I got a YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to go on to the uh, uh, YouTube channel. I know that um, uh, O'Shea, you dropped a couple of links. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to go up there. Um, almost at 10,000 subs. Woo! <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a long, arduous road. You know, I, I'm doing the, the nine to five thing during the day. And then I try to do the YouTube thing uh, at night and whenever I can. So it's been a lot of work, um, you know, kind of going back into your last question of diversifying kind of what it is that you bring to the table and making sure that you, you know, are relatively uncomfortable, um, you know, within a comfortable situation. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of the reasons why I started going hard on that situation uh, on a on a YouTube channel is because I had some things that happened at an organizational level that was like, I was like looking up above like, oh, oh is the sky falling? And this happened, <laughs> like, 20, yeah, like, <laughs> and this happened in like 2018. And, you know, before 2018, I mean, I'm posting on my Instagram, me shaking hands with people at the organization that I'm from and, you know, really kind of solidify within my mind the concept of you're exchanging money for time or skills or resource, you know, whatever it is that, that, that you can bring to the table. So I had to look within that and try to uh, diversify the things that, 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 that I'm bringing to the table. Um, so I will say, you know, feel free to go on my channel. Now, uh, the topics that we're talking about tonight is generally what I do not talk about on right. the channel. Um, right. But feel free if you guys are like interested in getting into- oh, they, um, like they, will like they, they like that kind of shit. Oh, they do? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all gonna like what you guys talk about. It's, it's very similar to what we talk about, you know, kind of, but it's more, you know, uh, you know, red pill type of thing. So um, thank you, Mr. Kojo. What's up, Ghost? Guys, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Please press one if you have subscribed today. Right, because the brother has like uh, 9,920 subscribers, and um, we have let's see if we can put that number up, you know. Like I said, so guys, subscribe, hit the bell, hit the link there. I'm posting in the chat, we have 120 people. Um, so if it, trust me, you will not be disappointed in the channel. Thank you, brother Reggie, for subscribing. That's a good brother right there, brother Dane Christopher, brother Ryan. Thank you for the dark man, Jeff. Out of South Carolina, I try to say North Carolina. No, nah, nigga, it's South Carolina. So South Carolina, brother Robert. Thank you, brother. The Ghost, Carl Black, Mr. Kojo. I did, but I couldn't kick on your league. D Stanton, go to. All right, it's mediocre. Let's let me write the channel down. Okay, let's do this. Media, mediocre tutorials and reviews. Right. Yeah, it's long. I apologize for that. No, no. <laughs> There it is, right there. All right. Yeah. All right, you got it. All right, thank you. And hit the bell, right? Go, yeah, make yeah. Sure you and hit the bell. Sure don't subscribe. Yeah. Hit the bell, okay? If you have to subscribe, go ahead and hit the notification bell because you know YouTube be tripping. Trip. Hit the yeah. notification bell. Don't just subscribe, y'all. Hit the notification bell. Kill yeah. Deuce, hit the notification bell. Stanton, did you do that? Kojo, did you do that? Carl Black, did you hit the notification bell? Mr. Ricky, did you hit the notification bell? Eric, oh. Did you hit the notification bell, player? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you, hey, 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 Sean. All right, so we got like 10 more over there. Okay, 
So Great. yeah, because thank you for the art and that stuff. Because once you get to ten thousand, they'll let you. Um, the, and the important thing about that is that they'll let you um, upload um, the YouTube stories. Yeah, which will blow your channel up, right? So we want to help him do that, man. Let's help him get to ten thousand so he can use that uh, YouTube stories feature because that's a definitely good feature you want to have. Everybody wants to have that because then your channel can really blow up. Um, and thank you, brother Joshua. Uh, thank you, uh, brother Sam. Thank you so much for the support. So guys, keep doing that. And then uh, we want to make sure that our brother can get to 10,000. It's so important um, for that because it makes it easier once you get to 10,000 as a YouTuber. You're like, whoo, I finally hit that milestone there. Finally, milestone. Finally. Thank you. So, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate everyone in the chat. You know, it's um, I, 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 I typically don't go over the things that we're talking about today on the channel. <clears throat> on the channel but yeah if you guys like O'Shea stuff you'll 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 find maybe you'll find some interest in the stuff that i do you oh know, no we, be, you got some good lookers over there too player i appreciate you bro you know what i mean yeah. I, I try to keep them this COVID is messing it up i'm doing a lot more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my it's, it's goodness not, it's messing it up you know i, I can't right. get a haircut that's why i got this so you know what i mean right, like right. i can't have them over <laughs> yeah 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 so uh he's uh what's it called it said uh Thank you, my brother Cornelius. I was just talking to him a little bit earlier. Shout out to my brother out of Memphis, and he's out driving, making all that long money. So shout out to my brother out of Memphis. He's really, really good brother out there. And, uh, you know, like I said, I appreciate all of you brothers. Uh, any last words, man? It is 4.32 a.m., man, because I, I missed you the last few times, right? I'm like, nah, fuck that. I'm staying up tonight. We're going to take care of this shit today. So yeah. any last words? Yeah, just just real quick. So again, O'Shea, I, I appreciate the platform to be able to communicate. You know, I, I live by the mantra, each one, teach one to reach one. And I really and truly believe that because I feel like a lot of people, they cannot dream what they cannot see. And, you know, um, my mission is to be able to give back to young brothers that, you know, didn't know about something to more inform a decision that they're making in their lives to make their lives more fulfilled or more happy. So I appreciate the time tonight to be able to communicate to these things. You know, guys in the chat, feel free to subscribe. You know, also, I got an email address in there as well. If you have additional questions, send me over an email. Um, and I, I would love to be able to talk about this business school thing in, in that decision. What's the email? What's the email? I put it on the screen now. It's uh same thing. It's uh, mediocre tutorials and reviews at gmail.com. No, um, no spaces. It's it's lo it's long, <laughs> but me. That's why we got copy and paste player. All right, let me go ahead here and whoop. So Dope. let me do this here. So guys, uh, that's the email address. Please, please do not be. They're gonna be, brother. Yeah, brother. I saw you on um, brother O'Shea's channel, brother. Uh, I would love to ask about forty-five thousand. Questions. <laughs> uh, for, you know, them niggas be long winded, man. First question is, brother, um, where right. did you get the glasses from, brother? I was trying to find them. You know, I, you know that's how <laughs> niggas be, they be asking stupid ass questions. Facts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Car Designer Grace, designer for the big three. When they when this hit, they sent everyone home with laptops. If you didn't have one, they pulled your desktop out and make you put it in your car. God damn, really. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> them niggas make you take a <laughs> get the plugs, nigga. Get the plugs and get the keyboard, nigga. Right, get the goddamn keyboard. Up, you dropped the motherfucker. Pick the motherfucker up, nigga. Um, <laughs> fact, time for money. You know, you on the clock. They gonna make you work. Fuck that monitor up. We ain't got insurance on that shit. Um, right. so guys, make sure you go ahead and um and and and, and email our brother again. We are gonna do Hall of Game tomorrow. Uh, maybe the brother can come back. I, I'm trying to get my smart shit on. But I definitely appreciate our brother here. Shout out to everybody in the building. Um, any last words, brother? No, I'm I'm willing to come back whenever you want to have me, brother. I, I really appreciate you. I appreciate okay. everyone in the chat. Okay. Okay, cool. Peace out, everybody. Thanks again, brother, for coming on. All right. Peace. Peace.